just to keep awake for an, another 40 minutes or so, let's go through this, okay? Um, so, actually, this is after alignment, this is the first part that goes into the analysis. And this part is not difficult, fortunately. And uh, you don't need a lot of uh, brain cells to be activated to understand it. So, uh, it's a straightforward thing. But there's some considerations you have to make when you analyze the data. Okay, so we went through this uh, uh, flow chart that I thought is pretty neat. And uh, this is the part that I'm going to focus, which is the gene expression part. It's very uh, beginning stage. And the question here is, uh, after we got the RNA sequencing data, how are we going to measure the gene expression? And uh, it can be pretty simple, right? So if this is one gene, this is another gene, and uh, this express this much, this express this much, and you just measure the, the number, common number of rays that fall each into each individual gene. And you can have a pretty reasonable ref inference on how much the regional uh, expression level is. Okay? Uh, but things become a little bit more complicated with this type of scenario because, uh, as you can see, the longer the gene is, uh, uh, even with a much lower expression levels, if you only count the total number of rays, uh, they probably they are the same. So it's not a, 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 a very reasonable, um, very accurate measurement. It's only based on the counts, right? So we know that the number of counts that we are uh, detected is uh, determined by a couple of factors. The first one is uh, the level of uh, expression of the gene. So some genes express more than others, and uh, of course the more it is, the more rays that we will detect. And the second one is the length of the gene. The longer genes that we have the potential to see more rays. And the third one is actually the depth of the sequencing. So if for one sample, they are based on the same depth of sequencing. But for different samples, and one sample you may use 20 million rays to map the entire transcriptome, the other one uses 50 million rays. And of course, for the second one, that you will detect more signals in the second sample, but that doesn't mean that gene expression level is higher. So these three factors actually determine the, the number of rays. And the measurement for that is something very simple, and it, it is the first presented in that uh, um, nature method paper just I talk about, the first paper I talk about. It's called RDKM or it's called the read per kilo based exome model per million mappable rays. Okay? So R here is the expression level of the gene. This is something that we want to estimate based on RNA sequencing data. And the C is the number of total rays that fall into this region. This is our measurement. And the N here is uh, the depth of the sequencing, how many total rays that we are having. And the L is the length of the gene. Okay? So you do this uh, level of normalization. So you can see this measurement is straightforward, meaning that they are doing two levels of normalization here. There is normalized based on the length of the gene. The longer the gene is, the, the more signal you're supposed to detect and also based on the total number of depths of that sample. So this is something called the RPKM. Okay? And the later, that uh, uh, with the pair end rays, and then people talk about the FPKM, and it stands for fragments of per kilo base exome model per million mappable rays. Basically, they are the same thing, just one for the uh, single end, the other one for the pair end. Okay? One example here, I just made it up. I want to make a point. Uh, here is uh, one gene total exome size, let's say 3,000 base pair, an RNA sequencing experiment contains 32 million mappable rays. We have detected 512 rays into, in the exome region and the conduct expression level for this uh, in RPKM. So what you do is uh, you got this uh, total number divided by this K uh, this is M, which is uh, 32 million, you just put 32 there, right? And, uh, and the other one is uh, 3,000 base pair, you just put 3.23. So this is in a unit of 1,000, this is in a unit for million, and after that you calculate this gene expression, it's uh, close to 5 RPKM. Very simple, straightforward, yes? So you would do this? Each sample, each gene, yes. Yeah, we'll do this for each sample, each gene. 
And uh, there's a couple of factors that are affecting RPKM. This is kind of straightforward. And, uh, and some of the samples are longer than others. And uh, some of them are have higher expressions. So you, if you look, only look for the read count, you can see this one, two, three, four. And uh, this is uh, their, their numbers. But once you correctly calculate the RPKM, you can see the fourth sample, even though the total count is high, and uh, the expression level estimation for that gene is not very high because, of, uh, it's a, it's because it's uh, longer than the other isoforms. It's very straightforward stuff, okay? But things are more complicated. If it's that easy, we, we don't have to go through this, right? Especially that we talk about the Chris Burge paper, we found out as many as uh, 92% of multi-axon genes can be alternative spliced, meaning they have multiple isoforms. And this is not a universe, this is not an individual problem, it's a universal problem, because we know that in general genes are. And many genes have closed parallels, some reads cannot be assigned into a transcript. So let's look at this figure. So you can see this is one gene have two different isoforms. There are some axons that are included in both, and others are unique to each other, okay? For this type of scenario, how do we calculate that L? How do we calculate that length? That becomes a tricky issue, and, and uh, you can see that uh, if we, what, what we are observing is at this location, there are so many rays accumulated and, uh, at each individual location, but how can we reallocate each individual rays back to their proper acyl forms? It can be tricky, right? And uh, for these two, we probably can think, oh, let's just use this uh, to measure this acyl form one, use this to measure acyl form two. And those are pretty straightforward, but for the constitutive axons, which means that the axons are in both two acyl forms, how do we know that which rate is from which acyl form? It can be tricky. And the strategies to do that is uh, to estimate isoform level expression rather than using the entire gene as a unit. Now you're using each individual isoform as a unit. And by counting only the rates that map uniquely to a single isoform. So what that tells you is uh, I'm go when I measure, estimate the, the expression level for isoform number two, I only use uh, these rates. Okay? For isoform number one, I only use these rays. And all the other rays, I'm, I cannot use it because I don't know which isoform it comes from. The problem of this approach is it loses too much information because uh, we know that alternative splicing occurred a lot, but the alternative splice axons are still only a very small part of the gene. So that we, we, we are not using the whole information. And they're also not working for genes without a unique axon. Sometimes if you have multiple isoforms, there's a crazy thing. There's one gene in Drosophila has over 30,000 isoforms. Okay? It's bigger than the entire human genome. So once that thing happens, you can forget about that. There's no way we can study that gene anyways. But the point is that there is a lot of genes They have more than three, more than four different isoforms. Those are pretty common, but how do we reallocate those back? It becomes really, really tricky. And the next strategy is a, it's a battery. It's a kind of called the isoform expression uh, methods. And what they do is that they use the maximum likelihood methods, which I'm not going to go to the, the equation part of it, maybe a little bit in the next lecture. But the point here is, uh, and, and actually example includes the couplings and missile are both general, I mean, the people in my lab know these two very intensively. I mean, they, they know that we use that a lot. But the point is, this is uh, some type of isoform expression methods, okay? Uh, and the, the general strategy for that is uh, I'm going to start from those rays uh, that are unique to each individual acid form. I'm going to estimate this, estimate this. But that is only my point estimation, meaning that I don't have a confidence interval. I don't know what's the range of it, okay? And then they further use the statistical approach to reallocate the number of different rays in, in the constitutive axon into different uh, 
ethyl forms. Okay? And this is more like a statistical inference issue. And at this stage, you not only get one measurement for the percentage of uh, the, the ethyl form, how many was the percentage expressed in the final product, but also you are getting a confidence interval of that. Okay? So based on this approach, it's, uh, it's not only using, it, it, it uses more information in the axons that are uniquely to each, assigned to each individual ethyl form, but also it takes advantage of the other ethyl forms in the same time, uh, other axons in the same time. So that increased the powers. And uh, this type of approach is not accurate for low expression genes with many different ethyl forms. Okay? And, uh, but things doesn't have to be that complicated, right? So if our goal is uh, to estimate gene expression per gene, not per isoform, I don't care about isoform, I just want to know how much this gene expressed, right? Alternative splicing, which isoform expressed how much? That's other people's, people's business. So let's first define a gene expression, and which is the sum of the expression of all its isoforms, okay? Straightforward. And if we are going to this route, there's still two general approaches. The first one is uh, it's called the axon union method. So let's, let's go through this figure a little bit. And this is uh, for the first isoform and this uh, second isoform. These are all on the transcript level. And this is on the genome level, so different axons. So you can see if I see a blue, Dark blue one, that means it's only coming from this, uh, the first isoform. This is only from the second isoform. And for this hybridized one, it's from, from both two isoforms. Okay? For the axon union method, is, uh, I'm going to focus on everything as long as it present, this axon present in one of all the isoforms, I'm counting it. This is my overall length of this particular gene. And on the contrary, there's uh, another one, it's called the axon intersection methods, which means that I only focus on the axons that occurred in both two isoforms and getting rid of uh, the middle ones, which are alternative spliced. Okay? There are two general strategies. For the axon union approach, which means when I'm using the entire, as long as it occurred in any of them, I'm going to use it. Okay, there's a problem of that, which is uh, the underestimated expression levels for alternative spliced genes. Okay, so what, uh, actually, if you think, uh, think it through, it's quite simple. And uh, because uh, once I see this uh, particular ax axon and express it in the second isoform, not in the first isoform, but when I make the calculation using the everything together as uh, my lens, I'm overcounting the lens, so I'm overcorrecting my samples. And here is in the real sample, you can see that this x is the true lab value, and this is the estimated value based on uh, this approach. And this uh, axon union method clearly underestimated the expression level of the gene. So that is a potential problem. Okay? And uh, for the axon intersection method, which means I only use the constitutive axons, uh, and for the alternative splice ones, I get rid of it. And uh, the problem of that is also reduce the power of a differential to identify differential expression, because uh, you uh, are getting rid of a lot of information, which may be useful uh, for some other applications. And uh, so you are you're supposed to have better, more deeper measurement, but you don't get it because you remove those uh, uh, alternative splice axons. Okay? Um, this is another thing that uh, I don't expect you to read from the board, but the point is we also have all the code to achieve this type of uh, functionalities to calculate the RPKM based on uh, whatever uh, alignment file that you may get. Okay. Our code also includes uh, diverse functionalities. It includes uh, gene expression, alternative splicing, and counts rates on predefined regions. And uh, it's, it's a flexible gene model, which means that uh, today we got another paper that has non-coding RNA and uh, new annotation. We can chip in our new annotation into that, and we can calculate uh, the things that we are calculating pretty easily. And uh, it also has the flexible normalization schemes. So, uh, we, we, our, the total uh, 
the m, the, the RPKM, the m normalization, which is the total number of arrays, that we can also use all arrays in the region, or all arrays in the genome, or 75% of arrays in the genome. So there's uh, things that you can tweak around. So different groups, uh, they are using different strategies, but our code can do that. Okay? The last topic of today, maybe five, six slides, is uh, about RNA sequencing differentially expression. So the previous uh, section, we are talking about uh, quantification. We are talking about which gene express how much based on RNA sequencing data. We are not talking about comparing two different samples. Now we are getting to the summary of uh, how to do the RNA sequencing differential expression analysis. So the fundamental question here is uh, how the expression level differ across conditions. Sometimes we are interested in just quantified, sometimes we want to see which gene differentially expressed between normal and cancer samples, for example. And over the past decades, actually, many methods have been developed for microarray-based studies, right? And uh, you can use uh, t-test, you can use uh, a more deeper analysis test based on different type of normalization. But uh, actually, many such methods can be directly for, uh, to the RNA sequencing data. For some earlier studies, and that we can use the RNA sequencing data to calculate the RPKM values. Let's say full, condition, full samples in one condition, full other samples in another condition, and for each individual gene, we just do the t-test. Well, that, that works, right? Especially when you go back to do the validation and uh, if it works. But that is not using the full potential of the data. However, that can work. So using uh, read coverage to quantify the gene expression levels, and the RPKM things that we talked about in the previous session, and then do the uh, various uh, statistics based on that. Okay? The distributions for the expression estimates needs to be considered because when we do the t-test, uh, one of the major assumptions is uh, the data follows normal distribution. Right? And uh, sometimes it, it doesn't. And uh, um, for the arrays, once we do the log transformation, we see the data roughly follows normal distribution. For the RNA sequencing, probably it's not. And there, if you know the specific distribution, make better sense, and you can build that into your estimation model. Okay? And the power of detection of this differential expression depends on the depth of the, sam the sample, how many rays you devoted for each individual sample, the expression of the gene and the length of the gene. So multiple factors are uh, important. And uh, to detect the, the differential expression, the first approach that being used is the Fisher's exact test statistics. It's very, very simple. So if you think this is one gene, and these are the rays I'm detecting in one sample, this is uh, in another sample, OK? And uh, here is I detect 16 rays out of this 10 million overall rays flow into this region. And here is 10 rays versus 16 out of 3 million overall rays. So it's not that difficult to, to see which gene, see this gene, uh, the, which, we, in which sample this gene expresses more than the other, right? It's clearly the bottom one expresses more because uh, the total number of overall rays is much less than this, and this is uh, uh, not too much less uh, uh, rays following to this region. Does that make sense? Okay. And uh, the way to do that becomes very simple. You just uh, form this uh, two by two contingency table. Okay, if you take you took uh, um, 651, the introduction of biostatistics, and then you know this is the most basic approach on in the statistics. So you see, just give the number of rays in sample A overlapping with the gene 16, not overlapping is 10 million minus 16, and uh, so is the for the se second sample. And then you do the the Fisher's exact test, you will be able to figure out uh, whether this gene is differentially expressed or not. Do you have a question? No? I thought you were thinking. Okay. And, uh, ah, <laughs> all right. And uh, for the fold change, how much different the gene expression level is, and you can calculate the fold odds ratio for that. It's very, very basic stuff. And, uh, for this type of approach, for experiment with uh, biological replicates, 
And what people do is combine the samples. And uh, this is really a waste because you are not uh, taking advantage of the distribution of the data at all. Okay? You just uh, merge it together. And a better approach for that is uh, to do the T statistics on a generalized linear model based gene expression estimation. Okay? I don't want to be uh, very mathematical driven, uh, but this formula is kind of uh, pretty simple. So you can see that this is uh, your measurements. Okay? We know the measurement is de determined by the lane effect, and uh, which is the total race is one of the effects, and maybe some other effects and it's kind of a batch effect type of thing. And this is the gene expression levels. This is something we want to estimate, and this is the other type of specific errors. So what people do is once they establish this type of linear, um, a generalized linear model, and you will be able to uh, estimate uh, this value, which is the gene expression based on the total number of counts. And then you further do the T statistics on that. So that is a people's uh, general strategy. But still it's not really optimal because uh, when, we do the, we would, when we do the statistical inference, if you think of a uh, t-test, the most simple case, right? And uh, what you really need is a two level of information. The first one is uh, the value, the differences, okay? So our point estimation. And the second one is the variation. And uh, if this is not very accurately measured, the variation is bigger. Otherwise, it's tighter. And if it's tighter, you have a better chance to give a good p-value. So you need not only the difference you measure, which is the point estimation, uh, but also you want to understand the, the variability. The, what's the distribution of the variability, including the technical variability and uh, the biological variability in these samples? in a large number of biological attributes. And there is a good assumption uh, for that is uh, the read counts uh, follow to one gene region actually can follow a Poisson distribution. Okay? And uh, if you think of the, the original definition of a Poisson distribution, I mean, it's a, in a limited time, the number of uh, uh, events occurred or, or things like it's very much similar to what we are observing here for the RNA sequencing data. For a big chunk of genetic region and how many reads fall into that region that follows a Poisson distribution. Okay? And uh, you can see this is the equation for that but the major advantage of uh, assuming it's a Poisson distribution is uh, we have a good estimation on the variance because if it fo it's, it's a Poisson that means that the variance is equal to mean. Okay? If uh, we can estimate our mean based on the observation, and we can have, like, roughly have an idea of the variance on that particular sample. So you've got not only the mean, but also the variance. And that is making your, your statistical inference much more powerful. Okay? Are we following this? I hope so, remotely. It goes through the podcast if you, you did not, okay? Well, if, uh, but you can see that for the Poisson distribution here, I'm having a question mark here. I mean, in theory, in principle, it makes sense. We are assuming the data follows the Poisson distribution. But in reality, is that correct or not? Okay? But once we go to people look at the real data, they found it's not a perfect crack. There's over dispersion factors uh, are involved. The so-called over dispersion is uh, when observed variance is higher than the theoretical variance. Okay, here is the theoretical variance. Okay, it's equal to the mean. But uh, when people look at the real data, they found for the larger expressed genes, and their their variance is higher than the mean of that time. So this is called the over dispersion. So in order to fix this problem, a, when over dispersion factor is considered, Poisson distribution can be generalized into another distrib distribution called the negative binomial distribution. Okay? If you, I'm, I'm sure that a lot of you know the equation of that. I'm honestly speaking, I've never seen it. All right. I know I can find it in Wikipedia, but, but it's, it's not going to be very difficult. It's be more difficult than that. 
But the major difference is it not only have the, the two parameters that are needed here, and it has another factor correcting the over dispersion. Okay? If that over dispersion factor is equal to zero, Poisson distribution is equivalent to, uh, I mean, negative binomial distribution is uh, equivalent to Poisson distribution. What happened? Okay. Oh, yeah. So there's a lot of other things, uh, statistical considerations that can be done, and there's a pages of pages of equations you can look at, and uh, all these things are in these dots, right? And the good news for that is some people know that uh, a lot of people are not capable of understanding what they're talking about, so they made an R package on that, right? So they, there's a couple of statistical packages in the uh, bell conductor package, or some of them are in the established softwares, and Edge R is one of it. Actually, it built in five different uh, assumptions, uh, different models into it. it. Just run through it and uh, let me know what it looks like. I haven't tried it. Okay. And uh, all right. Uh, another point here is uh, uh, when we talk about a differential expression between two different conditions. Okay, we are assuming that our quantification is accurate. So we ask that when we estimate the gene expression levels, we are assuming we already know their gene expression levels. So we want to only talk about the differential expression at this stage. And uh, but as we know that. Uh, it's, it's not that trivial, it's not that simple, right? There's uh, multiple ways to do that. So just uh, pay attention to that. So there's, this is uh, one example of uh, quantification strategies can affect the differential express analysis, okay? Intersection method didn't detect anything for this. So if I only use, uh, this is uh, one sample, this is another sample, the, the read distri distribution. So if I only use the constitutive axons, and then your end result is you don't see the differential expression between these two isoforms at all, okay? And uh, if I'm using a union approach, which is the overall thing, I'm going to see this uh, slightly difference, and therefore there will be potentially a significant p-value. So you can see exactly the same data, same analysis, I'm just uh, using two different ways to quantify my gene expression, and the result can be so different. Okay? You've got to pay attention to that. And uh, actually, if you use the isoform expression method for this, meaning that not uh, using the entire gene as a unit, rather to separate that into multiple isoforms, and you will be able to get a much higher sensitivity on the detection. However, we know that those uh, methods are pretty tricky, and sometimes uh, I don't really, uh, they gave a good p-value, very good p-value. When I go to look at the data, they just don't look like right. So when you see the risk distribution, sometimes you, ha you have to do the balance. But the point here is uh, the quantification can affect the gene expression difference detection. Summary of this part is, uh, the capacity of identifying differential expression can be affected by multiple factors. This include sequencing depths, library preparation, flow cell effects, and GC contents. And the good news is more and more bioinformatics and statistical methods are being developed at this stage. And if you, you look at the bioinformatics papers, it will come out, uh, something come out every day. Okay, I think uh, that's the end of it for the next lecture. Uh, we will have two parts. The first part will, uh, will be a guest lecture and talking about uh, transcriptome profiling in tumors. And I will finish it up with alternative splicing study and gene fusion identification. All right? That's it. Have a nice weekend. <laughs>